I start with a you know, like a brief introduction. I welcome you all and I thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for putting up this uh, wonderful conference, which I think is uh, very important. And uh, I thank also the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for inviting Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak. My name is Maria Domar Castro Varela, and it is a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce to you, on the occasion of Mark's anniversary, one of the most important scholars of our times, Professor Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak. It's not that brief. I mean, there is something to come. Dear oh, friends, <laughs> yeah. Applauding me rather than your introduction. I know, I know, I know, but there's still something to come. Dear friends, dear comrades, allow me, please, a kind of a personal note. Introducing Gayatri is at the same time easy and also difficult for me. Gayatri is a friend and an intellectual giant. And I know that she does not like to be perceived and described in these words, but like she once said, you can't control the way people perceive you. We try and we try hard to make people believe the stereotypes about ourselves, but the perception of our performances run through the eyes, the mind and the unconscious, and the outcome is another stereotype. That's why it is so difficult a task to introduce intellectuals to a public like you. You always talk also about yourself. It's kind of telling and revealing at the same time. To introduce an intellectual like Gayatri is like another form of a free association in the psychoanalytical sense. Freud described it as a technique where patients work through their own material. The problem is that I'm doing it in public and not in the private and safe space of a therapist's room. You make always a fool of yourself and show to a certain extent your vulnerabilities and reveal the huge spaces of ignorance you occupy. But that is exactly one of the lessons I learned from Gayatri. Don't be ashamed of your failures, learn from them. Don't accept your own intellectual shortcomings, work against it, and don't be proud of your deep privileged class background. Don't victimize yourself, learn from below, accept your own complicity with the system. She tells you that, she, and she lives according to what she preaches. She's never satisfied with her answers, with her arguments, never victimized herself, never trying to universalize her own and personal experiences. You have to be courageous, you have to be very courageous to work, think and write for so many years in a hostile context, outside, in the teaching machine, sexist, racist and contaminated with the common disease of anti-intellectualism. A system that tries to instrumentalize the racialized and gendered body, finding always new and tricky ways to disqualify and ridicule the ethical, political and intellectual sophisticated interventions of a professor of color. How often have I been confronted with the same judgment? Spivak's writing is too difficult, really too difficult. Is it? For whom? And why? What are you telling me by saying that? If we don't have time to engage with what seems to be difficult prose, how will we change the world? If we give up when an intellectual offers us a demanding argument and we reject the demand and we refuse to think, what does it say about those of us who like to perceive ourselves as indignados, but don't have time and patience to listen, always too impatient to train our minds? Gaitri, on the other hand, has not only been crucial in my own intellectual formation, but also demonstrated great courage in raising difficult questions when easy answers would have been more comforting and reassuring. She's a feminist, a Marxist, a deconstructivist, a Europeanist, an activist, a critique, and in her own words, a teacher. And in my personal perspective, an inspiration, a friend and a seducer in a very Gramscian sense. She seduces you to think and to rethink, to search for the contradictions, to read through the text without losing sight of yourself in the text. Outside in the teaching machine, she continuously fights against simple understandings, banal interpretations, and the instrumentalization of idealism and good intentions. Affirmative sabotage, a technique described and mastered by her is a way of entering a text, an argument, and turn it around by bringing to the surface the contradictions, the aporias. The avant-garde was never a fine idea. 
the rightfulness of the privileged, the compassion of the feudal crowd, the paternalism of the liberals is something that has to be antagonized. What does it mean to call for justice? What is justice anyway? What is, who and who is calling for justice? And what are those who are calling for justice ready to do so that justice can be realized? Does it suffice to quote Marx, to celebrate Luxembourg, to vote for the left and to sign petitions? For me, Gaitre Spivak is an intellectual giant whose global perspective interrupts the provincial and parochial. I'm not ashamed of saying it, I look up to her, also quite literally. <laughs> and perceive myself as a student, always trying to learn from her writings and her talks, always failing and failing again. Like Samuel Beckett once said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. What impresses me most is, of course, her incredible knowledge, but also her humor, her self-critical thinking, and her intellectual passion and restlessness. Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak occupies since 2007 the highest faculty rank of university professor in humanities at Columbia University in New York, where she is founding member of the school's Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. A literary critique, and in her own words, more than anything else, a teacher. She's one of the few scholars whose work has been tremendously influential for thousands of activists and academics the world over. She is known as a post-colonial theorist, describing herself, as is often quoted, as a practical Marxist feminist deconstructivist, as well as an ethical philosopher. Born in Kolkata, still at times of the British Raj, Gayatri received a BA degree in English from the famous Presidency College, University of Calcutta, in 1959, graduating first class honors and receiving gold medals for English and Bengali literature. After this, she completed her master's in English from Cornell University and then pursued her PhD while teaching at the University of Iowa. She taught in several universities before she arrived in 1991 at the Columbia University. Spielberg has been a Guggenheim Fellow, received numerous academic honors, including honorary guest professorships and several honorary doctorates. In 2012, Spielberg was awarded the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy for being, and I quote, a critical theorist and educator speaking for the humanities against intellectual colonialism in relation to the globalized world. In 2013, she received the Padma Bhushan, one of the highest civilian awards given by the Republic of India. Her essay, Can the Supportant Speak? Very often people only read the title in the last sentence. Can the Supportant Speak? No, they can't. There are like 50 pages in between. Is considered a founding text of post-colonial studies and her translation of Jacques Derrida's De la Grammatologie from French into English was groundbreaking as was the 75 pages introduction to the same book which set new standards for how to write an introductory preface. She has also translated the renowned writer Mahashvita Devi's work from Bengali into English. A critique of post-colonial reason, published in 1999, explores how major works of European epistemology, for example Kant and Hegel, not only tend to exclude the subaltern from their discussions, but actively prevent non-European from occupying positions as fully human subjects. To name some of her other influential publications, myself, I must remake, The Life and Poetry of W.B. Yeats, In Other Worlds, Essays in Cultural Politics, Selected Subaltern Studies, edited with Ranajit Guha, Outside in the Teaching Machine, Death of a Discipline, other Asias, and most recently, an aesthetic education in the area of globalization. She is also the founder of the Parish Chandra and Shivani Chakravarti Memorial Education Project, a non-profit organization which provides primary education of quality for subaltern children. The project currently operates schools in rural areas of West Bengal. By setting up schools and giving sustained training to local teachers who operate them with the help of local supervisors, the project tries, in her own words, to develop rituals of democratic habits in the largest sector of the Indian electorate. Spiva keeps transgressing traditional boundaries of disciplines and of theory and practice, breaking the rules. That's what she says she does. Not more, but also no less. Courageously and ceaselessly, 
impossible to introduce here. You only can say too less and too much and embarrass yourself. Please join me in welcoming Comrade Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really quite extraordinary. Um, now let me see if I can do this, okay? Bhindeshiyak pagol mare namole. This was the song written by the Communist Party of India on the 100th anniversary of Marx's death. That is to say, a crazy foreigner doesn't die, although dead. And that corner, akshoba churajai chole. Look, 100 years have passed. Now, of course, 200. Kano pore pore gorib rakhai mar. Why do the poor people uh, get beaten all the time? You are a diver in the sea and ocean of learning, and you explained it. But your real goal is to change the world. Only in theory, you don't get the truth. This is the song, right? And pagol more A crazy foreigner doesn't die though dead. No, it's not my party. Communist Party of India is not. I'm not in a party anyway. I'm with the Frontier Group, as I said last time. But it's even if it, I weren't with the Frontier Group, CPM L would be my party, not CPI. And also, there are no women in this song. So it, although it's very nice that I sang in my broken voice this song, just remember this is not an identitarian kind of claim to authenticity or anything. I just thought, what, since this is a, an anniversary, I should sing the anniversary song. Anyway, in this paper, I have accommodated three recipients. In London, a meeting on, on the philosophy and politics of capital today, in Berlin, a conference on the art and politics of Marxist feminism. And finally, in Yunnan, a conference on an imperative to reimagine the Silk Road, which was just two weeks ago. My title is Capital's Destinerance, Event and Task. Destinerance dislodges tous ceux qui, par quelques télécommunications, prétendent se destiner. Translated as all that, by some telecommunication, claims to destine itself. It is both a wandering away and a regular description of how a text reaches its implied reader. This is destinerance as event. This, in other words, is how it is. As I speak to you in what is known as the English language, it is common sense that I cannot know how each one of you is understanding this. Destinance, then, is a wandering away that is the regular description of how a text reaches its implied reader. This is Destinance as event. The implied reader of Capital Volume 1 was the working class as a collective. Even in its own day, this was subject to Destinance in the Northwest European context. The historical proof is the change after the Weimar Republic and ultimately ourselves at conferences such as this one. Endlessly talking variations on the talk while the target walk is walked by research and development, R&D, which is the biggest instrument of exploitation today. So all the stuff that we say, the policymakers do not listen to us. So it's kind of preaching to the choir. Endlessly talking variations on the talk, while the target walk is walked by research and development, R&D, and effectively reconstituted finance capital, helped by a corporatized education. The best students are in a hopelessly privatized dissertation machine, where the idea of knowledge remains knowledge about knowledge. Activism is fundraising, and otherwise occasional and national taken to be the irreducible local. We offer excuses for just hanging around with people around us by saying, in the global, you must be local. T-shirts. 
This is where destinerance as task has to be situated. I propose nothing new, that today the implied reader of Das Kapital must be shifted to the citizen. This is literally and practically an absurd declaration. This proposal that the implied reader of Das Kapital, in what language, for what niche, with what distant learning subject summarizing, swallowing whole the global capitalist hoax of full connectivity, without the desire or ability to confront these perilous questions, quote, global thought has become an intellectually defunct but well-subsidized industry today, thriving on a class caste system of nationalities. Under these, if you look at the Indians who come to talk to you, most of them are pretty upper class caste Hindus, talking left, of course, caste class continu uh, uh, con continuities. Under these circumstances, beset by these questions, we say that the proposal that the implied reader of Das Kapital must be shifted to the citizen is itself, of course, and indefinitely subject to the de desinérance. The other face of the citizenship coin is migrancy. I cannot dwell on the making useful of Das Kapital in this most crucial and diversified of contemporary global problems, migrancy, in the, the minutes assigned to me. I'll be very happy to talk about it in the Q&A. W.E.B. Du Bois had already proposed the accommodation of the question of citizenship as besieged by the color line into the question by implication of the implied readership of Das Kapital, so to speak. His own copy of Das Kapital is absolutely torn and worn and underlined all over the place. It's in Ghana. By implication of the implied readership of Das Kapital, so to speak, in suggesting that the approximately 200,000 fugitive slaves joining the Union Army at the time of the American Civil War shifted the war into a war against slavery rather than a war for the appropriate functioning of capitalism. And he called this movement a general strike. Nahum Chandler has suggested that such gestures transform or should transform our general constitution of the question of being and knowing not just the question of slavery. I would request that you read that book to modify your program, and then read Hortense Pillars to meditate gender. The possibility of citizenship as we grasp its immediate ideological sense and nuance still carries a platonic smell, lingering in the word, quote, city, except to my knowledge, which is limited here in Chinese, Arabic, and Turkish. To designate belonging to a nation state, now I always notice when the first person leaves. What did I do wrong? What did they expect I would say? Uh, to designate belonging to a nation state, most of us have stopped living, and now millions of people will leave. Well, have a good time. Most of us have stopped living in city states for rather a long time. And Plato's material is not even really about municipal government but about varieties of political behavior, how to behave like a citizen in various different ways, which pre-comprehends a certain rearing rather than training. For those of you who remember Plato's uh, Republic, which of course is actually called ways of political citizenly behavior, politeia, uh, those of you who remember, much of Plato's varieties of political behavior spring out of mothers misleading sons. You want a Marxist feminism, go look at that source text of democracy. We are still on the track of the implied reader of capital today, globally being the citizen of the nation state. The conflict is between a largely hyper-real global governance and a citizenship committed to the Greek word democracy. To the competitive tradition of international Islam, as it came to the place of another competition between the Eastern and Western Roman empires, Byzantium, the Platonic does not dictate anything. The Greeks are too close, simply the first Europeanized millet living outside the limits of the city. There is a theory that Istanbul simply means inside the city and is not just a corruption of Constantinople, Constantinopolis. Its more interesting derivation is the appellation Istinpolin, 
a name they apparently heard Byzantine Greeks use who were outside, which in reality was a Greek phrase, a Greek phrase, Aist and Polin, which meant in the city. Through a series of speech permutations over a span of centuries, this name became Istanbul, just a civic interiority, a Medina, also a city called a city, Medina forever Arabic, Istanbul forever inside from the Greek outsiders, as in India. And in Ottoman and modern Turkish, belonging to a geography is indicated by a word that can simply mean belonging to the patria. The notion of modern citizenship, I quote, Vatandaslik gradually surfaced. Holding a property was the main para parameter to have right to vote. No metaphor of the polis in that word. We must remember the importance of the existence of words that can be mobilized according to the politics poetry of the moment. During the so-called second constitution, which supposedly brought in modernity into Ottoman space, it is well known that Abdul Hamid, as he modernized the physical and social infrastructure of the state, increasing the provision of railway, telegraph, postal and quarantine services, and building schools, barracks and government offices, he tried to secure the support of his Muslim subjects by imbuing them with the spirit of loyalty to the Padshah, Sultan, and Caliph of all Muslims, the Ottoman equivalent of God, King, and Country, invoked by his fellow monarchs in Europe. Abdul Hamid's prudent, modernizing conservatism, supported by a large network of spies, kept the state more or less at peace and more or less intact for some 20 years. But it did so at the cost of stifling the initiative of the young Muslims whom his schools were training. In Voltaire's Candide, the Ottoman Sultan is the wisest religious sovereign, whereas Westphalia is a place of rape and murder. The history of the defeat of the, it's Voltaire calling, the history of the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in the face of European intervention and the superficial secularism received insufficient closure. The second call for allegiance to the Khilafat was launched by a section of Indian Muslims. It is possible to suggest that this call, maneuvered, was at least partially responsible for the divided face of independent India. This is the context within which the new Khilafat, undoing the European nation-state map-making that accompanied the end of the Ottoman Empire, has to be placed. <coughs> it is not the question of winning or losing by killing larger or smaller numbers of people. Uh, Balibar just wrote to Rashid Arain, whom should we support, Assad or Putin or dot, dot, dot. It is not a question of winning or losing by killing larger or smaller numbers of people. It is a question of a long-standing desire for an alternative internationality, gone bad, beyond repair, so that we cannot think of Capital Volume 1 or Marxist feminism wandering there by destinerance as event or task. That Osmanli desire, as you know, has not disappeared, not the least because the transition to modernity still kept the words to support that desire intact, and it can certainly be seen in the teens of the 21st century, in the denial of democracy by Erdogan. To designate belonging to a nation state, the possibility of citizenship as we understand it then, is no longer there in the history of the new Khilafat. Although the Kurdish army, many women leading, keep some possibility open in this year of 2018. Plato tabulates ways of being citizenly, motivated often by bad competitive motherly projection. In globality, those ways of being are necess ne necessarily accessible above a race, class, gender line, unevenly, when we talk about citizenship. We have not come to the end of that line. The uh, centralization of power in the court, and, uh, court in the, as the Ottoman Empire was breaking up inadvertently paved the way for the revolutionary rise of a new and more dangerous rival for power, the military. The new Khilafat is in the military, state or extra-state binary persistently deconstructed, supplemented into anchorless geopolitics. No good guys in sight, everything a means, to what end? What model of citizenship? Where is gender in that model as we congratulate ourselves? The possibility of citizenship as we understand it variously then is no longer there in the history of the new Khilafat. Talk about Marx's capital on its 150th birthday 
or talk about the Bolshevik Revolution on, on its centennial, or talk about Marx's birth, 200th year, which keeps itself confined to niche marketing by intellectuals, substituting citizen for worker, will not be able to set that text free, so that the enormous problem of migration, Euro-fetishized into colonialism, can be seen today within that larger historical problem, the history of the various desires for the various khilafats. Again, this is an immense topic, and I will not be able to do justice to it during the talk. I mention it in the interest of future work and to get out of the prison house of benevolent Europe. As I said to the Creative Time Summit at Toronto in September 2017, we are equally caught in a bureaucratical, quantified, egalitarian summits, festivals, conferences, circuit, preaching to the choir, supported by corporate funding and corporate universities giving up on the responsibility of critical teaching like my own. We are organic to the ideology that lets capitalist globalization survive by repeatedly congratulating ourselves. In response to this, a long-time, quote, activist from Croatia suggested that we should get as much money as possible from the corporate sector, presumably to proliferate huge quantified global conferences on resistance. Confusion between money and capital, to his later take in capital, further between capital and capitalism. Confusion between money and capital, and between capital and capitalism. Here one proceeds from Marx's mockery in the Grundrisse of those who think Socialism can make good use of capital, to his later take, self-corrected, in capital, where he establishes the centrifugal figure of labor as the pivotal questioning point of his critique and implies the use of consensual capital for social justice. We can follow the line through the chapter on so-called primitive accumulation. He says so-called, zogenante, primitive accumulation, to the chapter in volume three, where this intervention with capital effaces the difference between all modes of production. Many committed readers of Marx feel that Capital Three is both continuous with and transgressive from volumes one and two. One of the most famous, quote, transgressive, transgressive passages in Capital Three is the invocation of the realm of freedom. Marx's robust, unexamined humanism developed from the early task of correcting Hegel as we know, he says in 18, 1844, that the only labor Hegel knows and recognizes is geistic labor, which is translated as abstract or mental. Marx's efforts to undo this, as he composes a phenomenology of capital, is the major subject of his own, perhaps perceived, task of setting Hegel destinerant. I do not know when or if I will have the opportunity to track that setting to work. I've already marked an important way station that you all know, the discovery of what he calls a Zwischlechtigkeit, or centrifugality in labor power, the judicious use of which by the agent of production, namely the collectivity of workers as citizens, would bring about presumably the kind of structure of governance that would support the realm of freedom described in the most important transgressive passage. This calls for an understanding of a Zwischlechtigkeit, his word, a centrifugality between the private and the public in the social that Marx's occasional class-based shrewdness surmised but never theorized as the task of setting Hegelian phenomenology destinerant, acknowledging the material Zwischlechtigkeit of the Geist as the unacknowledged public over against Bewusstsein as private. This is Hegel's version. Does this matter in the practical art of politics? I can show you if you work with me, not in this room. Hegel made it clear that the phenomenology went forward, not with Bewusstsein, but with Geist. You know, that whole section of Schöne Seele is quoted almost word for word in Marx as he changes. Hegel made it clear that Lenin said that you had to read the science of logic in order to read Marx. No, you have to read the phenomenology, especially those sections, as reason moves to Geist. Hegel made it clear that the phenomenology went forward not with Bewusstsein, but with Geist, although the emergence of the former was instrumental in the emergence of the latter. 
he repeatedly pointed at the overturning contrast, Umweltung, not revolution, overturning, not even Aufhebung, overturning contrast between the individual consciousness, falsely self-conscious of itself as agent. Remember that as you congratulate yourself in the name of Marx. He repeatedly pointed at the overturning contrast between the individual consciousness, falsely self-conscious of itself as agent, and the Allgemein, the proper acting space for Geist. Consciousness lodged in the Allgemein makes sublation or aufhebung possible through Rede, or general speech. Lacan calls Hegel metonymic of psychoanalysis. In the obsessively over-repeated warnings, not to confuse Bewusstsein's self-confidence, as opposed to the structural development of truth in Geist, it is possible, obsessively over-repeating, it is possible to see the imaginary symbolic play of the distancing between interpretation and its principle being staged. This provides the empty space which Marx can call the realm of freedom in his humanist language. This is the transgressive moment that we can occupy, we ourselves, to introduce the incalculable, the supplement always considered dangerous by mechanical Marxists. Imaginative training for the ungeneralizable, singular, persistent preparation for the ethical reflex in the context of many gendered subjects, the absence of which in general education brought the first set of revolutions to heel. The passage invites careful reading. Marx, interested only in the economic sphere at the, that point, complements capital in this well-known passage. It is one of the civilizatorish sides of capital, civilizing, not civilizing. It's a funny word, not a completely absent word, but not quite the right word, civilizatorish, sides of capital, that it extorts this surplus labor, he writes, in a manner and in conditions that are more advantageous to the development of productive powers, of social relations, and to the creation of elements for a higher renewal than was the case under the earlier forms of slavery, serfdom, etc. It is important that he's not speaking of capitalism here. In this passage, Marx is looking forward to the socialist use of capital. I'm thinking especially of phrases such as Gesellschaftliche Verhältnisse, where the adjective can almost be socialist. Gesellschaftlich, it's actually vergesellschaftet, of course, but that's not what, there's an echo. And the noun is the more philosophical Verhältnis, suggesting a philosophically correct structural position, as in Hegel and Kant, rather than the more colloquial Beziehung, which means relationship. And of the phrase, eine höhere Neubildung, we can say that it is close to the Hegelian Aufhebung or sublation. This is, says Marx, what capital does. And the capitalist disappears from the passage. This is where our globally diversified effort can teach and pre practice Marxism by persistently dehumanizing greed as the primum mobile, the dangerous supplement, one-on-one -on -one yet collective, destinerans. Marx doesn't think of that. The capitalist disappears in the later transgressive descriptions of the socialized use of capital because capital frees. In the next movement of this rich paragraph, Marx once again generalizes, bringing all modes of production together, bringing Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft together, a contrast supported in Morgan's anthropology, Marx's main source. In Morgan, the evolutionary theory goes from the Iroquois, a tribe he joined by invitation, to industrial society, of which he is critical. He was a senator and a railroad worker, Marx and Engels valued the diversity of his experience. The dialectical understanding of social formations, as you know, was introduced later by Ferdinand Tönnies. It is not surprising that Tönnies found in Karl Marx one of the authorities for this analysis between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. He even wrote a little book on Marx early in the 20th century. Here is the loss of the proper name of modes of production as a subjunctive goal in the original German, it is a list of conditions that would make socialism possible. Marx points at capital's rationalizing capability 
Exchangeability begins in nature, as he has said again and again, although Engels kept correcting him. That's, I've written another piece about this. Uh, Marx puts it back in the footnote, then Engels puts it back in the text. And most of the explanations of use, value, and so on are quoting the Engels passage. Exchangeability begins in nature, says uh, Marx. Before capital, nature ruled the human like a blind power, says Marx. And socialized capital, associated producers, control this originary exchangeability. Stoffwechsel, usually metabolism, translates literally into exchange of material. Exchangeability with nature, communally, in a rational way, writes Marx. Here is the passage. Freedom in this sphere can consist only in this, writes Marx, that socialized man, as he writes, the associated producers, govern their metabolism with nature in a rational way, bringing it under their communal or gemeinschaftlich control, instead of being in bondage to it, beherrscht zu werden, as a blind power. Shades of the master-slave dialectic are clear here. For the dialectic to function, Bewusstsein had had to emerge in Hegel after voiding the place of sinnliche Gewissheit or sense certainty, and then itself declassed in preference to a spatio-structural intuition of Geist. In the various capitals I'm suggesting, Marx does not go there, and thus he opens a space for destinerance as task, not only for social justice, but planetary justice, making the rational control of exchange with nature more than merely rational. In this passage, for example, Marx suggests that in the entire world, all modes of production together is the realm of necessity which supports human development for its own sake. In the passage that I'm quoting above, Marx is considering freedom within the realm of necessity, in diesem Gebiet. The real realm of freedom is beyond social engineering. But we are getting ahead of, of ourselves. Marx says that in, when he describes the realm of freedom outside of the realm of necessity. The real realm of freedom is beyond social engineering. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Let us continue reading. Here is the passage restricted to the realm of necessity, social engineering. First, Marx takes the small peasant, the least likely candidate. These were the people who, in fact, are in the 18 Brumaire, as the people who cannot represent themselves. Marx takes the small peasant, the least likely candidate, as proof of the illusion that capitalism is the norm. Then he shows us how easy it is to disprove this illusion by painting that effortless picture of a socialist state. I quote, because a form of production that does not correspond to the capitalist mode of production, the self-employed small peasant can be subsumed under its forms of revenue. And up to a certain point, this is not incorrect. The illusion that capitalist structural relationships are the natural structural relationships of any mode of production is further reinforced. Again, in the US, in New York City, small business might as well be complete communism. Small is beautiful. Marx writes, if, however, one reduces wages to their general pay, and don't forget social media, they're not even small. If, however, one reduces wages to their general basis, writes Marx, that is that portion of the product of his labor which goes into the worker's own individual consumption, if one frees this share from its capitalist limit, and expands it to the scale of consumption that is allowed, on the one hand, by the existing social productivity, that is the social productive power of his own labor as effectively social, and on the other hand, claimed by the full development of individuality, if one further reduces, who is this one? Further reduces surplus labor and surplus product to the degree claimed by the given conditions of production, on the one hand, to form an insurance and reserve fund. On the other hand, for the constant expansion of reproduction in the degree determined by social need. If finally one includes in both one, the necessary labor, and two, the surplus labor, the amount of labor that those capable of work must always perform for those members of society not yet capable or no longer capable of working. That is, if one strips both wages and surplus value of their specifically capitalist character, nothing of these forms remains then, but simply those general grounds of the forms that are common, gemeinschaftlich, to all social, gesellschaftlich modes of production. 
Unfortunately, this can, without destinérance, translate into the kind of globalization hoax that is perpetrated because everybody forgets the theft of surplus value, etc. Capital is only socially productive, is what we are told again and again. Network society, connectivity, and we buy it. Hal Draper, <clears throat> Hal Draper has suggested that the early Marx understood dictatorship in terms of left democracy. I have not checked his meticulous documentation. I knew Hal slightly, he was a total hero. I have not checked his meticulous documentation. It does seem, however, that if Marx came to distrust the state because of the potentially globalizing power of capital, against which only an international would suffice, it is the inhabiting contradiction within democracy, which I pointed at yesterday, and therefore within gendered class citizenship in Britain, his chosen, chosen refuge, as within every so-called democracy, the contradiction between liberty, ipsaity as autonomy, and equality, alterity as others who do not resemble me, that Marx ignored in ignoring the conflict within the use of the word social. On the one hand, quantified labor power, and on the other hand, the collectivity of agents who will use the abstract average labor power to generate a surplus that would be used to de as described in the transgressive passage above to make Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft come together. This latter requires citizenly behavior, as in Plato. Where does that come from? The point was, of course, to generate a Zuya Schlechtigkeit within the social, precisely between something like the public quantified labor and something like the private desire for social justice or self-enrichment, to revise Hegel's achieved justice and to open it to permanent revolution. Marx could not think it through as theory. There is a lot of irritation and impatience in practice. He does know this as a shrewd, intelligent man, but it's not there when he's talking about, especially in the transgressive passages, about the possibility of social justice. Marx's change in 1844, when at 26 he opened Hegel and the Wealth of Nations, from national economy to political economy, from nation state to an international perspective, because capital was international, is well known. He was preparing, as I say, to write the phenomenology of capital without focusing only on Geist. Yet Moishe Postone, recently dead, said in his last interview that when Marx moved to Britain, he became a Victorian. It is also true that in the important postface to the second edition of Capital One, Marx wrote that because Britain was then the best example of advanced capitalism, it was the appropriate place from which to produce a critique in the classical German philosophical sense of capital as such, whereas anything produced at that point in Germany would be a mishmash. Mishmash is Marx's word, mishmash. Marxism has not recovered from this ongoing focus on the nation state rather Britain than Germany at that point. Marxism has not recovered from this ongoing focus on the nation state in spite of its declared interest in the international or the global. This is why yesterday I said to Daphne Weber at the conference uh, here uh, privately that the presentation that I heard were presentations, I only was able to hear that one because I was working on, a, on this speech which is not unrevised first draft, do forgive me that the presentations that I heard were too focused on the German state. And it was somewhat symptomatic that she missed this as me say, saying it was a critical critique of being German style. Let me repeat that because of this unacknowledged yet necessary focus on the nation state, the globe is not a world, that focus is necessary, therefore we should make it part of our task. The destinant subject of Marxism today is the citizen in its robust sense, and we have to realize that in the current context, this is an absurd statement. I heard yesterday that in Austria, a cultural worker dismissed my work as, quote, become too canonical. I think we witnessed yesterday, or, or the only thing that I saw, and if I'm sure there were many papers that were not like that, I think we witnessed yesterday an effort to make Frigga Haug's work forever new, forever trying to find new focus, too canonical, by emphasizing its weakest, weakest point, its base in Germany. Therefore, let me say that the European Union, perceived as a collection of debtor states and creditor states, not a union, with Germany as an uneasy head, should not be mistaken 
for your necessary preoccupation with what you think is local, in other words, state-based. As my colleague Javier Salai Martin repeats, he's the co-inventor of the Global Competitiveness Index. When he speaks to the ministries of finance, what? What happened? Huh? I can't hear. This? Oh. Okay. Well, it, you know, you don't really need to hear this. The, um, as uh, my colleague Javier Salai Martin repeats, he's the co-inventor of the Global Competitiveness Index, that when he speaks to the ministries of finance in Rwanda and or in Canada, although he's advising both ministries to find new places for economic growth, he's not saying the same thing. He's on the other side, old Javier. He's a very nice guy. His wife is the doctor for the Manchester United football team. And so, you know, he's a, like a good man from Barcelona. But nonetheless, he's on the other side. You know, he's the co-inventor of the economic growth index. But even he says that the ministries of finance are not the same. So we, therefore, on the left, need to remember that the local of the German state is not the same as the local of the huge war camps where women are stored willy-nilly today, subject to the rape culture and bribe culture most of the world takes as natural. To remember that is the art of politics. Rape is the best bribe still. To remember that is, quote, the art of po politics, which is in your subtitle, because it requires imagination. We cannot congratulate ourselves on local victories, state-based, whatever the state, and think of it as the only model of Marxist feminism. This is why, at the end of Moshe Poston's interview, it was very recent, the recommended reading list remains four white men. To replace Poston's criticism of the Victorian Marx, we must consider Marx's very well-known final exchange with a woman, Vera Zasulic, where, after many anguished drafts, Marx introduces the final response, which basically says, in response to Zasulich's question, how do we establish capitalism-based Marxism in peasant commune-based Asian Russia? Marx says, I don't know. I mean, they're very available, and I'm sure most of you in this room have read them. Long, long, long drafted uh, answers, and finally just this very short answer, because he couldn't find something right at the end of his life as he's learning Russian. So he says, I don't know. Now, this... Uh, you must work it out yourself, too much at that point for the European imagination. And Marx's imagination was strong. It is in this context that we have to consider Lenin's establishment of the Comintern in 1919 and think gender in that context. In George Padmore's invaluable words, when, I quote, the expected revolution in Western European countries, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Poland, failed to materialize, Lenin turned, not only towards the illiterate workers and uncultured mujiks of Tsarist Russia, but also the even more backward workers and peasants of feudal China. And of course, the progressive bourgeoisie of the colonies, like ourselves. We must not forget that the Comintern was dismissed because in 1943, at the end of the Second World War, approaching, not quite at the end, 43, Stalin needed to keep alive the alliance with the UK and the US. It is connected with your history, the disappearance of the Comintern. And indeed, Rosa Luxemburg's words to Lenin, not in the nationalism debate, but from prison in 1918, that he should not ignore the peasant communal nature of larger Russia, must also be heard again and remembered. In the second meeting of the Comintern, M. N. Roy, the Bengali communist, gave the important generalization for Europe, industrial capitalism. For the rest of the world, agricultural capitalism. Lenin and Bukharin loved this. Mao strategically had to continue to speak about the proletarian revolution. Next year, Lenin is dead. Stalin hates M. N. Roy, who removes himself to establish the Communist Party in Mexico. If Marxist feminism ignores this history, it is not going to be able to establish anything like a generalizable movement. There will be no curiosity about canonical Spivak saying to canonical Haug that feminism needs to interrupt Marxism in order to keep on with Haug's important and powerfully autocritical European memory work, otherwise forgotten in the self-congratulation of the European Marxist feminist version of the local. It was interesting to me that Daphne Weber's response to my correction of German style, which she thought was German style, 
to a focus uh, moved uh, to a focus on the German state was that they did, uh, did not consider race sufficiently. I agree with the Du Bois who demonstrates to us that racism is a universally available ideology to, make, to take care of the self-determination of capital. My interest therefore is not identity-based racism or reverse racism, but rather the global nature of capital, which now must repeatedly spectralize the rural in order to keep focused on areas of advanced capitalism as producing the best local endeavors in the name of a networked society. To refuse anything but local successes is not to be Marxist. I want therefore to close with some words that I said in China on April 15th. I was attempting as an Indian to inhabit a generalized Chinese subject rather than inhabit the US or Indian nationalist subject available to me, too competitive with China to do so. Can your version of Marxist feminism imagine such a broad base rather than taking a concern with the underclass migrant and a fetishization of colonialism as the last word? The title I proposed and our radiating globality international collective approved was imperatives to reimagine the Silk Road. The Silk Road we believe is one of the long standing cultural mindsets that have been animated by today's possibility of a networked world to reimagine the new connectivity. The title is an echo of an earlier title, Imperatives to Reimagine the Planet, that I proposed to Stiftung Dialogik in Zurich, Switzerland, 21 years ago, as they were restructuring to move from rescuing Jews who had managed to escape from Hitler's concentration camps during the Second World War, to providing asylum for refugees from Rwanda, Somalia, Turkey, and the like. An imperative is an urgent command generally brought about by external circumstances. And in that particular case in Switzerland 21 years ago, external circumstances that had changed from a European to a global situation. The original Silk Road was one of the greatest unifying trade enterprises undertaken by what we now call China, as the world systems theorists showed us some time ago. Indeed, my connection to that part of the world is based in the fact that my city of birth, Calcutta, and that ancient city of Yunnan had been trading partners since the 14th century CE. One of the magnificences attached to the original Silk Road enterprise was the great difficulty of actual physical movement through sometimes seemingly insurmountable terrain. Today, the imperative to reimagine that unifying idea comes from the fact that those physical difficulties have been dwarfed through the scientific achievements of global travel as well as networking and accessibility promoted by digitality, yet complicated by geopolitical violence. These generated the new imperatives that I proposed in the title accepted by our Chinese participants, imperatives to reimagine the Silk Road. Nearly 200 years ago, Karl Marx wrote the, those unforgettable words about the proletarian revolution, which China fulfilled in the last century, and I've talked about Mao's need to strategize. And these are extremely well-known words, but worth, worth reading again carefully. Bourgeois revolutions, Marx wrote, such as those of the 18th century, storm quickly from success to success. They outdo each other in dramatic effects. Men and things seem set in sparkling diamonds, and each day's spirit is ecstatic, but they're short-lived. They soon reach their high point, and society has to undergo a long period of regret. Marx's word is katsanyama. Has to undergo a long period of regret until it has learned to assimilate soberly, soberly, you see, the results of its period of storm and stress. Proletarian revolutions, however, Marx writes, such as those of the 19th century, constantly engage in self-criticism and in repeated interruptions of their own course they return to what has apparently already been accomplished in order to begin the task again. With merciless thoroughness, they mock the inadequate, weak, and wretched aspects of their first attempts. They seem to throw their opponent to the ground only to see him draw new strength, fish, draw new strength, come on, be big. Only to see them draw new strength from the earth and rise again before them more colossal than ever, they shrink back again and again before the indeterminate immensity of their own goals, 
until the situation is created in which any retreat is impossible and the conditions themselves cry out. The conditions cry out. Hikrodus Hiksalta, here is the rose dance here. We all know this passage. What Marx describes here, however, is an imperative brought about by external circumstances, the situation. In globality, we confront such an imperative today for the unifying enterprise of the Silk Road, apart from others, brought about by digital and geopolitical circumstances. We were there at the conference inaugurating the Trans Regional Institute in China in response to our um, uh, conference idea to start questioning what the nature of that diversified and multifocal response to the imperative would be. This can be a long-standing project undertaken with the spirit of globality, with the deep language learning that can bring the world's wealth of languages in line with Yunnan's wealth of languages. Imagine how remote it is from what we've been talking about. A new and already established destination for the Silk Road today, huh? yes, last page. A new and already established destination for the Silk Road today is continental Africa. I hope in the future work together, this is a line that we will pursue vigorously. There are Africans in our collective. In the best tradition of Chinese thinking, we will work together for the academic nuancing of the political. Last page, just be patient a little bit. This is where the word quote imagination is important. As we know, in the passage that I have quoted from Marx, finally Marx says that the contemporary revolution will take its contents from the poetry of the future, I quote. The social revolution of the 19th century can only create its poetry from the future, not from the past. It cannot begin its own work until it has sloughed off all its superstitions and its superstitious regard for the past. Earlier revolutions have needed world historical reminiscences to deaden their awareness of their own content. In order to arrive at its own content, the revolution of the 19th century must let the dead bury its dead. In the 21st century, the imperatives of a globality, Marx could only imagine, saying capital would move with Gedankenschnelle, the speed of thought, if and when it could or would be able to, that moves capital much faster than mere thought can, the 21st century, the imperatives of a globality, moving capital much faster, faster than Gedankenschnelle, an imperative to reimagine the past rather than bury it has emerged. So it is a different, little different from what Marx was talking about. I'm asking European Marxist feminists to reimagine the Comintern beyond its European decolonizing past with a memory working feminism worked in, the poetry of the future. Marx uses the broad Greek origin word, poesy, of course, poiesis doesn't mean the same thing in Greek, but let's forget it, uh, we can't go into that. Marx uses the broad Greek origin word, poesy, rather than the common German word, dichtung, much used by intellectuals of his time to relate, relate it to truth, you, know, you, you all know that. Marx had a doctorate in Greek philosophy and knew his Aristotle backwards, although he also acknowledged that Aristotle could not have produced the labor theory of value. But Aristotle did suggest that poesie, poiesis, was a better method of knowing, philosophoteron, than history, and prefiguring the future than historiography itself. I believe Marx's use of the Greek word poesie, rather than the common German word dichtung, directed us to that possibility. Poetry as a method, not merely a metaphor. As China's great allegorical Confucian tradition knows well, poetry is related to the very possibility of imaginative interpretation. The imagination is neither rational nor irrational and holds rationality in its embrace. It keeps openings intact beyond the mistakes that we make with mere reasonableness, bloße Vernunft, because we are human. In this sense, we who work in literature, philosophy, and the qualitative social sciences come forward with the message that offers collaborative rather than corrective assistance to what mere knowledge management, as provided by the new digital, can perform. The digital is as powerful and dangerous as a wild horse. The imagination slow trains the rider to think the old in a new way, so that the new can also be thought in an old way without baseless golden ageism, a mere glorification rather than a reimagining of the past. Here I speak as a fellow Asian for both of our great traditions, the Chinese and Indian, we have joined together in the past, and I hope intellectually we can again without commodifying yoga. In the same spirit, in the same spirit, I would say in Germany, 
that it is necessary, indeed an imperative today, to imagine Marxist feminism as it begins constantly to disguise itself or to provide a disguise for global colonialism. Strong words, deeply felt, in order to consider the role of ourselves as we move from the European state to globality in the name of a critique of the Anthropocene and echo Haug's conviction, employability is not the criterion of dignity. As I have suggested, class continuous moves into the global south is not going to correct anything. If we want to go back to 1844 rather than 1818, decide to move from national economy to political economy rather than merely remember a nativity, ultimately a declaration of family values than which there is nothing less Marxist feminist. Thank you. Thank you, Grachi, for this. I found it a very fantastic paper, although you think very it was... Long. Yeah, it was very long, yeah, but... <laughs> no, not as long as Derrida. Not as long as Stanley Fish. Perhaps not as good as that. But on the other hand, if we're measuring length, men get away with much longer papers. <laughs> in fact, Homie got away with a hugely long paper in South Africa. No one stopped him. And, you know, I'm talking, and on 50 minutes, a very nice, wonderful African colleague, Professor Tenga said, so what happened? How about saying this when Homi was talking? <laughs> I'm sorry, this is not good form. I didn't find it too long. I think um, it is a, was a fantastic paper who made us also aware how important it is on one thing not to just celebrate the past, not to just celebrate also the work of Karl Marx, but to work with the work of Karl Marx and to reinvent also and reimagine the history because we are still hopeful that there might be a better future. And if you really think that there is a possibility for a better future, there is no other possibility than reimagine the past, so that the past and the future come together. There is one sentence um, that always um, you know, kept me thinking and that you write in the introduction an aesthetic education in the area of globalization, and it is that the legacy of European enlightenment, and Karl Marx is, of course, early, um, also works in the legacy of European enlightenment, is doubt and not hope. It's more doubt and not hope. And there you also pled for a productive undoing that will bring us closer to what you call an epistemological change rearranging desires uncoercively, which is kind of a description of um, education. In which ways, I thought, is doubt and hope connected to education as rearrangement of desire? And how would you describe the paramount role of the humanities here, which you always like also try to bring at the foreground? So is that a question? That a question. Well, you know, I'm not against hope. It's a strong uh, version of hope, which is accompanied by informed doubt. So, uh, you know, I'm not uh, for, I mean, I'm not any kind of, I mean, I, I'm very strongly critical of the so-called Afro-pessimists, the uh, Afro-pessimism which began in France. I'm not any kind of a pessimist. I, although I'm, I won't go with optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect, because that is a kind of insistence on the will. God knows why Gramsci quoted it. It's ac it actually comes from Romain Rolland. But so I'm not going to separate it like that. I think a very strong willpower is fascist. But nonetheless, the idea of, I'm not giving up the idea of hope at all, but not leadership. I would like to say, I mean, in answer to your question, I would like to say that Abiola Irele's last writings, Irele was a Nigerian, um, Nigerian critic, a little bit older than I, died last July, and he gave me his last collections. I think I was talking about it yesterday. He gave me his last collection to introduce. And in it he has, and in this collection, he has an extraordinary uh, theme, which is called followership, which, is, which comes close both to subalt subalternity and citizenship. That is to say, the training of followers who can take leaders, to, who can question leaders, rather than the largest sectors of the electorate kept in such ignorance 
or such benevolence by the human rights folks that they are only body count voters, where democracy is just one equals one, so arithmetical form of the democratic structure. So that to an extent, that's where my hope lies. The hope of undoing the kind of privilege, not unlearning, you can't unlearn it, the kind of privilege that comes historically by putting it openly at work for those who do not resemble us. This is hope. So, you know, doubt is an extremely strong component of a hope that does not hope to define itself by fulfillment. Hope is not a declaration in a text, a declaration of a desire is not its fulfillment. It pushes you. So that to an extent, that is also something I find very important in Haug, that it is not to be, not to be fulfilled today or next year. And it is certainly not achieved by an electoral victory. So therefore, you know, I'm not against hope, but hope has to be more robust than just, oh look, we've, we won. That, I mean, I have lived in the United States since I was 19. So to an extent, I am American, although not a citizen. But the, and there, I think what is most reprehensible, although it has its moments, in our neck of the woods is touchy-feely. Oh, hey, empathize. No, sir, sorry. Don't imagine that you're untouched by the fact that you're from a superpower and you can touch people so easily. It's an effortful struggle. Sorry, have some doubt. That's what I would say. I'm not popular, but that's all right, I'm too old. But um, so an uncoercive rearrangement of desire, the uncoercive does not mean don't push. If you read again, the third, third thesis in Feuerbach, you will see that you cannot educate without shoving and pushing a bit. Nicely, as nicely as you can. I'm not a good teacher, so I'm not even very nice. But, uh, okay, but the uncoercive comes from the future anterior, an acknowledgement that whatever you plan, something else will have happened. Even when it looks like you're really succeeding it's a fool who thinks that they have succeeded. It's a, that's where the uncoercive comes from. You cannot say to your class, hey, do this and it'll work. First of all, because of the Cineros as event, but also because of the future anterior. You can't tell. So that's, but surely, I, I think there's about six minutes for more questions. So perhaps I can have a question or three. Six minutes, no? More or less, yeah. We can take like two or three questions from the audience and then put them together. Yes, there. I'm very interested in your, uh, Please wait for the mic. Because, uh, thank you. I'm, I would be very interested in uh, your project with the uh, new Silk Road. Could you explain it a little bit more? Yes, I don't have a project. See, that's why I went to speak to China. Because... The, they have, see, that's why I also said that I'm not a leader. I went to the place where state policy is one belt, one road. That's the name of the main policy now. And I also work a great deal in Africa, not as a leader, Africa-led things where the Africans need to respond to what I'm talking about, rather than just me coming down and saying, hey, do this, this is good Marxist stuff. But, uh, so, and anyway, I mean, like, it's laughable, the me saying this, I mean, nobody pays any attention, even if the colleagues do. But at any rate, so therefore, I wanted to go with um, our whole group, Radiating Globality. Our belief is that the picture of globalization as kind of in a, in a long straight line with colonialism inside and then national liberation and then, uh, you know, like uh, modernization and so on, and then globalization with the silicon chip, etc. That is, uh, that teleological picture is incorrect. That in fact, as globality has opened, which is why we need to pay attention to what we are doing with the nation state focus and while denying it, as globality has opened, the old structures of power, the long durée, has, uh, have come back 
in our case, the caste system, in China's case, that kind of connectivity, the one belt, one road, and so on. And in Europe's case, for example, this uh, need to interpolate the colonized by legitima legitimation by reversal, this kind of stuff is happening. And so we want to be taught by these places as to how. Therefore, we went, uh, at one point we went to Senegal, at another point we went to Calcutta, which is after all uh, my uh, hometown, so it wasn't that hard. Actually, we went to Chandernagore, let's not go there. But, uh, so we went to China because uh, we want, and some of us know Chinese well. I don't know Chinese well, but with us was Charles Armstrong who's Korean-American in spite of its name, his name, and he's uh, the head of the Korean uh, Studies Institute, and as a good Korean, he knows Chinese. With us was Hiroko Sakamoto, who is a Japanese sinologist. It was very important for us. Um, and uh, Hari Vasudevan, who's knew Russian very well, Indian Russianist, it was, I'm a Europeanist, it was very important for us to have folks together, you know, who were not just focused on their own so-called places of origin, to learn what would happen if we seriously involved another Chinese university which was responding. Because uh, in order to establish something, some kind of study of the Silk Road, which would not be identical with state policy. And this is where, and we also had Sylvain Sankal, Mamadou Djouf, etc., from Africa there, so that we could think this through. So it's not my project at all. It is indeed, all, all that I am is that I'm the facilitator of this collective which has been in existence now for about 10 years. The, so uh, we went there because we didn't want just to talk about it but be talked at, see how resistance comes, etc. And you know, I began my first day saying, the Chinese hate the Indians, and the Indians hate the Chinese. And then I turned to, and we were laughing together, because it's true. And so I, uh, I turned to Mamadou, dressed in the spiffiest suit and a wonderful tie. And I turned to him, and I said, and everybody hates the Africans. And Mamadou put his hand here, because it's true. Black Africans are roundly prejudiced against. In fact, even in the United States, in the Afro-American places full of uh, Afro-pessimism, it's American exceptionalism. Not quite hatred, but Africa just exists as an adjunct to the African diasporics. So therefore, it's, I mean, I take it such a long time to answer this question that there will be no more questions. Because I think this is, you asked a very good question. This is part of what I'm talking about. We don't know everything. We are not global by just reading many books and living in the United States where there are many diasporics and teaching at Columbia, which is a global class of many colors, but all superpower kids who want to help the world. So therefore, uh, the, I took a long uh, time to answer this. It is not my project. We went there to see what would happen. And it is just the beginning. We've just been sent a proposal from the university there. And then we'll sit down and have a meeting. I just wrote the email three days ago so that we can think about how much one can within an insurgent state capitalism and from a place like the United States and India think of something which would be a little bit different and just stay on it. I'll talk about it again if anything happens. And thank you for your question. Well, so hopeful last answer. Thank you so much for your patience. And uh, yeah, we keep on reimagining the history. Thank you. <laughs>